The book of Genesis is the first book of the Hebrew Bible, or as it is more commonly called, the Old Testament. Genesis is also the first book of the five books of Moses, known to the Jewish people as the Torah. This first book of the Bible is appropriately titled Genesis, for its name has the meaning of beginnings or origins, for it provides for us the story of the creation of the world and takes us back in time to the birth of human civilization. Believed to have been written by the holy prophet Moses, the book of Genesis takes us on a journey through a series of events transpiring over the course of a few thousand years. Beginning with the creation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the fall of mankind, the story of Noah and the Great Flood, then down to the patriarchs Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and finishing off with the children of Israel settling in the land of Egypt, the book of Genesis has much to say about life during the most ancient of times. Apart from the stories of biblical characters and all their drama, Genesis also presents a detailed genealogy of the people who populated the earth, going all the way back to the first man, Adam. The intent of this work is to present a concise overview of the history of our ancient ancestors and to also provide commentary on the ultimate role that God played in the personal lives of the patriarchs and prophets of old, a saga that in turn would alter the course of human history and reveal to mankind the benevolence of our divine Creator. Now the account of the Lord God creating the entire world in just six days is found in the first chapter of Genesis. However, in Genesis chapter 2, a more detailed description of the creation of Adam is given, and it is also here that we are introduced to the Garden of Eden for the first time. It would seem that the purpose of Genesis chapter 2 was intended to provide a recap of the events found in chapter 1. Genesis chapter 2 also goes into much detail concerning the initial creation story, while also incorporating additional elements of creation that are absent in chapter 1. Thus, the entire biblical creation story is laid out in two chapters, not just one. The reason for this may be that an overview of creation was intended to generally cover all of God's handiwork, while an additional chapter was needed to go into further detail concerning things of greater importance. Following directly from the creation stories of Genesis chapters 1 and 2, we come to the story of the serpent tempting Eve to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, beginning in chapter 3. But as we read in chapter 2, even before Eve was created, God instructed Adam not to eat of this particular tree, for God tells Adam that the day he eats of it, he will surely die. Since Eve was not present when the law of Eden was given to Adam, it must be assumed that Adam told Eve about God's law after the Lord brought forth the woman from the side of man. Now it is interesting to note that the serpent chose to tempt Eve and not Adam. It would seem that the devil was looking for a weak spot in order to get the man and woman to break God's law. If the serpent had come to Adam first, the man might not have listened. But through a deceptive dialogue with the woman, the devil managed to get Eve to break the commandment by promising her that the fruit would give her wisdom and that she would become like God himself, knowing both good and evil. The devil literally messed with the woman's mind, tricking her into doing something that was not in her best interest. But even worse to say of Eve was that instead of repenting for her sin, she gave the forbidden fruit to Adam, knowing full well that it was wrong. However, though Eve was deceived, Adam knew better. So instead of obeying God, Adam chose to listen to the woman, thus directly transgressing the law of his creator. Concerning the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it is traditionally believed that the forbidden fruit was an apple, yet the fathers of the church have something else to say. Though the forbidden fruit is not directly identified in Genesis, a clue as to the type of tree Adam and Eve sinfully ate from is hinted at when they lost their innocence. For the Bible tells us that after Adam and Eve partook of the fruit, their eyes were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they went on to use fig leaves as a means to cover their nakedness. This points to the fig tree as being the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and not an apple tree, which is more broadly and commonly assumed. Another place in the scriptures that alludes to the fig tree being the forbidden fruit is taken from the New Testament. For in Matthew chapter 21, verse 19, it is written that Jesus saw a fig tree in the way. He came to it and found nothing thereon but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee henceforth forever. And presently the fig tree withered away. Could Jesus have cursed this fruitless fig tree in response for what happened in the Garden of Eden several millennia before his incarnation? It would seem that the Lord cursed the very thing that was instrumental in plunging the world into sin. Thus, the Lord cursing the fig tree may have served as a testimony of Christ's triumph over sin and death. Returning to Adam and Eve, it is apparent that through their disobedience, the Lord expelled the sinful couple from paradise. Through their sin, death enters into the world, something foreign to the very nature of the life-giving Spirit of God. 
No longer will man live in bliss and eat freely from the trees in the Garden of Eden. Now that sin and death have entered the world, the earth becomes cursed and brings forth thorns and thistles. Now man must be forced to eat bread by the sweat of his face. Paradise is lost, and pain and suffering will replace the joys of Eden. From here on, mankind will live in exile. But before Adam and Eve fell from grace, many wonder just how long the world's first couple lasted in the Garden of Eden before they were cast out. From the patristic texts, there are conflicting writings that teach that Adam and Eve were living in paradise for as long as 40 days, or as short as 6 hours. 40 being the number of days Jesus was tempted in the wilderness, and 6 being the number of hours Christ hung upon the cross. Though it is not clearly defined in units of time, what can be safely interpreted is that the length of Adam and Eve's sojourn in Eden was indeed quite brief. Continuing on our journey through Genesis, we now arrive at the famous story of Cain and Abel, as found in the fourth chapter of this biblical book of beginnings. As part of the collective consciousness of Western culture, it is generally understood that God accepted Abel's offering and rejected Cain's sacrifice, leading Cain to rise up and kill his brother out of envy. However, what is generally misunderstood in this story is the significance of each of the brother's sacrifices. As Genesis tells us, Abel was a keeper of sheep and offered a lamb, while Cain was a farmer and offered up crops or vegetables. This has led many believers to assume that God prefers meat offerings as opposed to grain offerings. Because of this misunderstanding, many feel that God treated Cain unfairly. But in reality, the reason why God rejected Cain's offering and accepted Abel's was because Abel offered up the best of his flock to the Lord, while Cain offered up an inferior quality of the produce that he possessed. So the two differing sacrifices had more to do with the offering of first fruits versus the offering up of leftovers. The fact that Cain did not offer up a sacrifice of his choice crops unto the Lord reveals the darkened character and negative mentality of Cain. For Cain did not give the proper glory to God due to his sullen spiritual disposition. Furthermore, Cain was humiliated when he saw how God accepted his brother's sacrifice but rejected his. Cain was possessed with so much pride that he went to the extent of killing his own brother out of jealousy, for Cain could not bear the pain of his severely wounded ego. Even when God confronted Cain, questioning him about what had happened to Abel, Cain demonstrated how hardened his heart had become by disrespectfully replying to the Almighty, Am I my brother's keeper? As a result of Cain's fallen countenance and unrepentant heart, God cursed Cain from the earth, which received his brother's blood. For now the ground would not yield to him the fruits of the earth as it used to. Cain told God how unbearable his punishment was, but the curse still stuck. So Cain went out from the presence of the Lord, and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. After Cain was driven out, the Bible tells us that he begot a son with his wife, and named the child Enoch. Cain went on to build a city, and named it Enoch after his son. It was also at this time that the earth became split into two camps a righteous bloodline, and a wicked bloodline. For after the death of Abel, Adam and Eve would conceive another son, whom they named Seth. This godly child would serve as a replacement for Abel, for it was at this time that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now beginning with Seth, there would stem from him a series of ten righteous men who preserved a holy lineage while the rest of humanity became so corrupt that God decided to destroy the earth and all life upon it with a global flood. For the people in the antediluvian era became so depraved that God regretted that he had made man in the first place, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So God would preserve humanity and all animal life on the ark that Noah built in order to survive the flood. It was like God pressed the reset button and started all over again. After the water subsided, God promised Noah that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood and declared that whenever he sees the rainbow in the clouds, he would remember the covenant that he established between man and all of creation. In the years following the great flood, the Bible says that the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And as they traveled together, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and dwelt there. It was also at this moment when the people decided to build a tower whose top might reach into heaven and to make a name for themselves so that they wouldn't be scattered abroad throughout the face of all the earth. However, this act of defiance only kindled God's wrath once more. Wishing to put an end to the devices of the children of men, God came down and confused their languages and scattered them abroad throughout the face of all the earth, and the people ceased in their building endeavors. Thus, it is known as Babel, or the Tower of Babel, because there the Lord confounded the languages and scattered the people abroad upon the face of the earth. 
These events concerning the Tower of Babel occur in the 11th chapter of Genesis, and it is also midway through this chapter where the generations of Shem are recorded. Shem's descendants are listed all the way down to Abram, who further on in Genesis will come to be known as the patriarch and prophet Abraham. Now Abraham and his family originally hailed from Mesopotamia in the region of Haran, but later moved to the land of Canaan, an area known today as the territories encompassing the modern state of Israel and parts of southern Lebanon. For the one true God spoken to Abraham and instructed him to leave his father's house and travel to a land which the Lord would show him. For God promised that he would bless Abraham and make him a great nation, and that through him all the families of the earth would be blessed. God also promised Abraham that one day his descendants would be as numerous as the stars of heaven. Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted his faith unto righteousness. However, Abraham's wife Sarah was barren, and they had no children. So out of a lack of faith, Sarah gave her Egyptian handmaid to Abraham, in order that he might rise up seed with her. But later, the Lord promised that Sarah would conceive, and through this child the future nation of Israel would be established. For the son of Abraham and Sarah was named Isaac, and he went on to father Jacob, who would be given the new name of Israel by God himself. Israel fathered twelve sons, who had become known as the twelve tribes of Israel. The book of Genesis comes to a close with the patriarch Israel and his family settling in Egypt in an area known as the land of Goshen. For Israel's favorite son Joseph was previously sold into slavery by his jealous brothers. But through divine providence the family was united once more, and through Joseph's spiritual gifts he was able to save Egypt and all the surrounding lands from a severe famine that lasted for seven years. And when Israel was close to death, he gathered his sons together and prophesied over them, telling them of the things that would befall their descendants in the last days. Joseph too would utter a prophecy concerning the fate of his brethren while he was dying. For Joseph said to his brothers, I die, and God will surely visit you, and bring you out of this land, and to the land which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And Joseph took an oath with the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. So Joseph died, being a hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him and put him in a coffin in Egypt. See Genesis chapter 50, verses 24 through 26. Thus ends the amazing sacred historical history book Genesis. As an Orthodox Christian, I believe wholeheartedly in the truth of the stories told in Genesis. However, there are many skeptics out there who don't believe, with some members of the church included in this trend of unbelief. Sadly, even some priests disbelieve in the genealogies of Genesis, and as a result don't give the body of Christ the proper support. For Jesus himself spoke of Noah and the flood, as well as Adam and Eve, and Christ even mentioned Abel. So it is clear that the testimony of Jesus Christ confirms the validity of Genesis as a true story. The fact that Christ confends the reality of Genesis should give us Christians the inspiration to believe in the accounts of the Old Testament. For without the book of Genesis, there would be no book of Revelation. God's plan for the salvation of the world begins in the Old Testament, book of Genesis, and finds its fulfillment in the Gospel of the New Testament. Both the Old and New Testaments complement one another through the utterances of prophecies and the fulfillment of holy promises that indeed come to pass. The foreshadowing of things to come is also evident in Genesis, as are all the typologies that link the entire biblical record together into one book of two parts. And this righteous record has stood the test of time, and will continue to stand strong throughout the ages. For as Christ said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. See Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. This is the leap of faith.